Well, the book itself was written for the public. So first thing I did was to outline what I wanted to do. So I wanted to talk about climate change first, what we know, how we know it, and what the uncertainties are. And then the next question is what can you do about it? And that says looking at all of the alternatives to the standard fossil fuel, which we couldn't continue with business as usual anyway because it's going to get ever more expensive. And then the last part of the book looks at policies, good ones, bad ones, smart ones, dumb ones. Uh, unfortunately, there are more dumb ones than smart ones out there. Um, since the time when I finished the book, I actually finished it at uh, the end of 2008. The production cycle, at least with my publisher, Cambridge University Press, was such that uh, the editorial part was pretty fast. That was done in three or four months, but then it took over a year to get it produced and get it out of the bookstores. And then it appeared in uh, April of 2010, and here it is the end of 2011. And if we ask about what's changed, the answer is not much has changed. And I've come to think that if I write another one, I'm going to take a broader perspective on it. Um, energy that drives uh, our industry drives developing countries' industry, too. Energy that drives the broader economy drives the economy in developing countries, too. Uh, energy is important to national security. Nobody wants to be hostage to energy sources. So there's a national security dimension. And then there's the environmental dimension. So the environmental dimension includes a lot more than just climate change. And uh, I think that because of an excessively narrow focus on climate change, we're not making the progress that uh, we should make. Uh, in the US, we just discovered all sorts of shale gas and shale gas you can substitute for coal, and if you substitute shale gas for coal in a modern power plant, you reduce emissions uh, for a given amount of electricity generation by threefold. Greatest thing that's happened for environment is China has just discovered shale gas. Now if they, which are the world's biggest consumer of coal, if they start substituting gas for coal, then we're going to see emissions go down. Uh, eventually, you may have to get rid of the gas, too. But you don't have to do it now. Right now, there are two big things you can do. Gas is one of them that have a very large impact on the environment, on the economy, and on national security. So let's get on with it. Uh, what are the barriers to it? Well, uh, there are my laws of government, government inertia. Uh, Physicists like laws. We're all jealous of Newton. Newton has laws of motion, and every physicist wants a law of his or her own. So mine start with uh, the first law, the future's hard to predict because it hasn't happened yet. That sounds like Yogi Berra, but it isn't. It's just genuine Richter. And the implication of that one is, let's wait. We don't know enough. Let's not do anything. Let's wait till we know more. And then, there comes uh, the next law. No matter how much good something does, someone will say, let's wait for a better one. And that says, the quest for the perfect drives out the practical. And then the third law says, um, short-term pain trumps any long-term gain. So somebody, if you want to do something, is going to say, oh, taxes are going to go up. Even if it saves the economy a huge amount of money later on, nothing is going to happen. Uh, I can go on with more laws, but those are the three principal laws of government inertia. And we have to do something to get over them. Uh, personal opinion, we're not going to make any progress on the energy frontier until after the election of 2012. We may not make progress after that, but we sure aren't going to make any till then. 
So tell me your thoughts on the recent Durban climate talks. Ah, the Durban climate talks. They're another loser. Uh, they were the loser. The Kyoto Treaty, I've never been very fond of. I think that this notion of legally binding emission limits is silly. Uh, Canada, our friend and neighbor, has hugely exceeded its uh, commitments under Kyoto. But so what? Who levies the fine? Who collects the money? Who decides what to do with it? Um, European Union, they haven't made theirs either, in spite of all the noise they make about temperature rises and all of that. But who levies the fine? Who collects the money? Uh, there's no teeth in this binding international treaty. And you can look at another uh, one, the Montreal Protocol, which had to do with the ozone hole over the Antarctic. That worked. I took the small groups of countries who were the biggest emitters and it got them together and it got them to work out a way to reduce things. Not everybody reduced at the same rate, but everybody started down. There are 15 countries that are responsible for over 80% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. And if you're worried about greenhouse gas emissions, you ought to get those 15 countries together, not 196 countries all arguing about how we're going to get the richer ones to pay our bills. Get those 15 together and start working things out. Uh, I took a group of 15, although 10 are responsible for 70%, because I wanted to make sure there were countries that were industrialized, countries that were developing very rapidly, and countries just beginning to start development in the group. So I had to stretch it to get 15. So China's in it, rapidly developing. India's in it, we're in it. The European Union's in it. But Indonesia is in it too. Brazil is in it also. South Africa is in it. Uh, I would have some hope that 15 countries could hammer out something a lot easier than 196. Is there any push to do that? I think there's beginning to be a realization that this legally binding stuff is not really legally binding. People think if it's legally binding, by God, you're going to get punished if you don't make it. Nobody's going to put Canada in jail. Nobody can find Canada $10 billion and collect the money because Canada doesn't have to give it to anybody. There's no mechanism for it. So it's all talk and getting 196 nations around the table to negotiate is not going to get us any place. We need something more streamlined.